morning. Uh, now I'd like to actually talk to you a little bit more about some of the things with trauma and health. And I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about sleep. Uh, sleep is a you know very important mechanism. It's one of the things that is impacted by trauma. It is impacted by depression. And it's one of the things that really can have a huge impact on health. And so again, when we start talking about what are some possible mechanisms uh, that you know leads to trauma causing health problems, uh, looking at sleep is actually really important. Okay, so here is one of the main issues. You know, is like that we know that sleep problems are related to both heart disease and metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is the precursor syndrome to type 2 diabetes. Okay, so we know it actually has a really, uh, you know, very important uh, health effect. And so again, like I said, we want to make sure that uh, we lower the risk for metabolic syndrome because it's the thing that kind of predicts the other two diseases. Okay, and what's scary is we also know that sleep problems increase inflammation. Okay, as you can kind of see, as we, you know, we're finding that more and more chronic illnesses are related to kind of an underlying state of sort of chronic inflammation. And so again, chronic inflammation is obviously something we don't want. And so when somebody's having a sleep problem and it's elevating their level of inflammation, uh, then we know um, that actually that's one of the areas where we can intervene. Okay, so um, and this was actually from Ed Suarez's uh, chapter that he wrote in the Psychoneuroimmunology of Chronic Disease. Um, he said sleep disorders such as primary insomnia, okay, so very common sleep disorder, are obstructive sleep apnea. And, you know, that's actually particularly like snoring. And we're finding snoring actually has, you know, a huge impact on health. It increases inflammation, basically. So we look at it through a number of different markers. The C-reactive protein, which is one I mentioned in the earlier module, but also uh, these two pro-inflammatory cytokines known as IL-6 and TNF-alpha. And both of these are actually really important markers for chronic disease. But the scary thing is that even subclinical sleep disorders, you know, so again, they don't necessarily meet the standard of, you know, uh, con you know, obstructive sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome. Even somebody who's just sleeping poorly, uh, it actually does increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and all-cause mortality. Now, you might wonder why. Why is sleep important? Well, we know from the previous slide that it increases inflammation, so that's one reason. That's one reason why it's important. But the other thing is of what it does to insulin levels. Okay, and this was actually from Bruce McEwen's work, and this was again to me a rather frightening finding because you know when you start looking at somebody who is chronically sleep deprived or chronically short on sleep, uh, you know what he noted is first of all you get an elevation if somebody's got sleep deprivation. It only takes a couple of days before you get a chronic elevation in cortisol, which is one of the stress hormones that we talked about in the earlier module. But it also increases glucose levels and it increases insulin resistance. Okay, so insulin resistance is one of the four symptoms of metabolic syndrome. It's not a good symptom to have. Okay, it's when you start, when you have this kind of pattern, what you start getting, first of all, is weight gain around the middle. Okay, and it's not just kind of in the back. It's that sort of frontal, you know, visceral obesity. So that obesity around the waist. And we know that that is actually really specifically related to things like cardiovascular risk. You know, it's interesting. It's one of the reasons actually why the BMI is not necessarily a great predictor of health. Because... You can be heavy, you know, in your in your butt, in your thighs, uh, and even in your back, and it doesn't really impact your health the way the weight around the middle does. Okay, and we know sleep actually specifically contributes to that. Okay, so if somebody is not sleeping well, they tend to gain weight. And where actually this has been studied a lot is actually with nurses uh, who do shift work. And work, if you're working on the, the, the evening shift or especially the overnight shift, uh, oftentimes nurses will tell you it's very difficult to keep weight off. You know, and it really isn't just because people bring in snacks. I mean, that certainly doesn't help. But it's partly due to the, you know, the problem with not getting enough sleep. Okay, so we also know that disturbed sleep also increases the risk of depression, and it increases the risk of, of obesity, and particularly that more dangerous sort of visceral or abdominal obesity. Okay, so those are the things that we know happen. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the sleep parameters that we need to know about. Okay, so again, because it's like I said, well, you say I have sleep problems. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about a couple that are kind of specific. Uh, this is a really important one. This is called sleep latency. This basically is the number of minutes it takes for you to go to sleep. Uh, and in the postpartum depression world, incidentally, they found actually that the number of minutes it takes to get to sleep is highly predictive of depression. Uh, in fact, when I do trainings on postpartum depression, it's one of the things I talk about. You know, ask your mothers. How many minutes does it take you to get to sleep? If it's more than 25, they're at high risk for depression. You know, interestingly, 20 is actually not a problem, but 25 is. 
Uh, so again, like I said, it's one of the things, you know, even looking at your own sleep, you know, if you're chronically taking a very long time to get to sleep, um, this is one of the, you know, sort of markers of, you know, risk for things like trauma and depression. Okay, sleep efficiency, and again, this tends to be one of the things that tends to suffer when you've got somebody with a trauma history, you know, is how much time they spend in bed versus how much time they actually are sleeping. Okay, now this is not, you know, uh, as one of my friends once asked me, this is not you sitting in bed reading a book. Uh, this is you're trying to go to sleep and you're tossing in your journey and you're not sleeping. Okay, so that tends to be a lower sleep efficiency and that's specifically related to trauma history as well. Okay, also REM latency. Now this is something that you really can't know about yourself without having it measured. Okay, it's got to be measured with a polysomnographic measurement. Uh, and basically what you need to do is actually look at particularly the EEG patterns. And what you actually, uh, we see from sleep research, which I think is actually really interesting, explains, I think, a lot of symptoms, is we know that actually people, for example, who are depressed, and we haven't really studied this yet with post-traumatic stress disorder, but I think we find the same thing, uh, is that people who are depressed sleep very differently than people who are not. Uh, and basically what happens is, you know, during the early part of the night, you know, you tend to have these long stretches of the, the slower wave, okay, the deep sleep. Okay, you have long stretches of that, and then you go back up and you go to a more active state, the REM sleep, or rapid eye movement. Okay, now the REM sleep is, you know, they're both important, both the slow wave and the REM. Um, but the REM sleep uh, is where you're closer to being awake. Okay, your brain is almost awake during that point. Okay, and so during the first part of the night, somebody who's not depressed tends to have these nice long stretches of slow wave, sort of inner, you know, it's a, with these kind of intermittent kind of periods of, you know, short periods of REM sleep, and then back down to slow wave. Now, you know, partway through the night, that actually changes, and you start getting, you know, the opposite pattern, long stretches of REM and little bits of slow wave. Now, somebody who's depressed, what happens to them is, in fact, that first part of the night basically gets chopped off. And say they're no longer getting those nice, long st stretches of slow wave sleep. Okay, and so that's called reduced REM latency. It's a reduction in the amount of time before REM becomes the predominant state. Now, you might think, okay, well, you know, that's very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Well, here's the reason why it's important. First of all, if you're not getting slow wave sleep, you tend to have more daytime fatigue. Okay, the other thing is, uh, if you are not getting slow wave sleep, what ends up happening is you end up having more pain. Because it's during slow wave sleep that your body actually can repair all the little micro traumas that happen to you during the day. You know, you smack into a, you know, a corner, uh, you bump into a wall. You know, all those little things, we don't even think about them because our body takes care of them normally during the night, during slow wave sleep. But let's say you're not getting slow wave sleep. You're going to be more likely the next morning to wake up and head to a pain. And in fact, that's one of the characteristic symptoms you see with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition that actually affects all four quadrants of the body. And one of the characteristics of fibromyalgia is very disturbed sleep. Uh, in fact, what sleep researchers have discovered is that patients, particularly if they have severe symptoms, tend to have, you know, when they go into that sort of slow wave sleep, then they get a super you know, imposing a more active brainwave patterns on top of that slow wave sleep. So what you in fact have is instead of getting good slow wave sleep, you're basically taking slow wave sleep completely out of the equation. Okay, and in fact these same researchers actually kind of tested a hypothesis about this. It's like they, they wondered what would happen if they took somebody who didn't have fibromyalgia, in other words a normal control volunteer, and had them come into the lab and, you know, hook them up to all the monitors and every time they hit slow wave sleep they woke them up. Well, that's in fact what they did. And so when, you know, these patients would, you know, or these uh, control volunteers, when they would hit slow wave sleep, they, that's what they did all night long. Woke them up, woke them up, woke them up, woke them up. Next morning, these, these volunteers had head to toe body pain. Okay, so basically what the researchers did was they induced fibromyalgia in the lab. Now, the fibromyalgia symptoms went away after a couple of days of normal sleep. But think what's happening if somebody is depressed and actually, they've not studied this with PTSD, but we see similar disturbances with PTSD. Okay, so if somebody's got a history of PTSD or they have, or they have depression, okay, and what's going to happen to them with a the slow wave sleep? They're probably not going to get as good as slow wave sleep, which means not only are they going to be more tired during the day, they're also going to have more pain. Okay, and you can actually kind of unfortunately see how sleep just kind of tends to reinforce itself. You know, you start having sleep problems, you have more pain, which means you're not sleeping as well, which means you have more pain, and you get into this very, very bad cycle. 
You know, and as I mentioned from the previous slide, you know, you also got your inflammation levels going up, you got your insulin resistance going up, and you can see how we start seeing problems, you know, that can develop and why you might have health problems. So sleep is a really important mechanism for trauma survivors in terms of health. Uh, and finally, uh, again, the total amount of slow wave sleep is also important. Okay, and so again, these are the other variables that we look at. So these are the really kind of the key things that we look at. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we know that actually sleep duration is one of the things that's related to obesity. Okay, so again, like I said, you know, I, I personally get kind of tired of hearing people talking all about diet and exercise and never addressing something like trauma history or sleep. Sleep makes a difference. This was a big study. They did a meta-analysis, which means they took the results of a bunch of different studies, put them all together, and reanalyzed them. So they had over 600,000 people across 36 different studies. Okay, included both children and adults, and they found that short sleep duration uh, of less than five hours was related to obesity rates worldwide. Okay, so, you know, no matter what country you live in, if you're a child or if you're an adult, if you're not getting at least five hours or more of sleep a night. Okay, and again, think about somebody who's got chronically disturbed sleep because they have trauma history, they have PTSD. Okay, and so, as I mentioned before, poor sleep quality and things like depression uh, tend to be sort of mutually maintaining because, you know, if you're not getting sleep, you're going to be more depressed. And if you're more depressed, it's going to be compromising your sleep quality. Same thing with post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, if you have PTSD, uh, you know, you're not going to probably get good sleep, and then that's going to probably make your symptoms more active. And in fact, in at least one study, they found that when, you know, looking at a, a group of sexual assault survivors, when they addressed the sleep issues, the trauma symptoms got better. So we know that they are actually mutually maintaining. Uh, and in fact, you see, you know, we know that sleep issues are really important in terms of uh, mental health issues. You know, in fact, we see that, you know, insomnia increases the risk for new onset depression and anxiety disorders. Uh, and also sleep disturbances are a really common symptom of psychiatric disorders. And we know, you know, from recent studies of PTSD, there's very, very common in PTSD. So again, you know, sleep is one of those things, I think it's kind of one of the elephants in the room. It's one of those things that really does need to be addressed. Uh, and I think we're just starting as a field to really kind of look at it and address it. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea, this is a population study from Japan, which I thought was actually kind of interesting, and it really does show you that there does seem to be kind of an optimal amount of sleep. Uh, you know, so somewhere between six to eight hours. You know, uh, I've seen different texts that say, oh, you need 8.4 hours. It's like, well, you know, that's not really based on anything. Not everybody needs 8.4 hours, but we need at least six. That's kind of what the research, I think, is showing. Okay, and actually, uh, sleep duration, uh, people who had a sleep duration of six to eight hours had the lowest rates of depression. Okay, so again, like I said, depression is also a very common symptom following trauma. Uh, and so again, sleep is very related. Uh, now, what was interesting is uh, we had a chance with, in my data set from this uh, survey of mother sleep and fatigue to take a look at the impact of sexual assault on sleep. Uh, and again, we were looking at a population of new mothers, which tends to not be a group that gets a lot of sleep, uh, generally speaking. And what we actually found is, again, you know, not surprising, uh, sexual assault impacted sleep in some pretty specific ways. Okay, I think we could call this a pervasive negative effect. Okay, so we had 994 women who had a history of sexual assault, and we compared them to the rest of the sample. Of, you know, we had 6,410 in the total sample. Okay, so you can see big difference in the minutes to get to sleep. Remember, I said that that's a very predictive, um, you know, symptom for things like depression. It's also an indication of trauma history. The total number of hours of sleep per night, again, a very key kind of measure of well-being. Okay, if somebody is reporting that they're not getting good sleep, chances are they're going to report their well-being is actually pretty poor. Okay, and so again, like I said, you know, if they had no history of sexual assault, and remember, this is, this is mothers of children, you know, under the age of a year. Okay, so that tends to be a pretty sleep-deprived group, generally speaking, but you can actually see uh, they're getting between 6.5 and 6.6 .6 hours a night if they have no history. Uh, with a, a big difference, and again, all of these were highly significant differences. Okay, so about 6.4 hours. Okay, and so again, it impacted things like their perception of their physical health. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, uh, you know, if the women with a, without a history of sexual assault were much more likely to rate their health as, you know, excellent or very good. Uh, and we know from just a long-term health effect that that really actually is really quite predictive of a number of things. When they've done, you know, in more general populations, when they've done studies where they have rated, had people rate their health at time one, you know, and given everybody a physical at the beginning to say, okay, everybody's in health, 
you know, and then when you look at them five years later, the people who tended to rate their health as, you know, fair to poor were more likely to have actually died, you know, between the two studies. Uh, and so what's interesting, again, like I said, it's, it's predictive of a number of things. So it's an important indice of health. Okay, and you see also, too, it's reflected in things like their daily energy levels. Okay, so again, you know, we know that sleep is actually very related. We can understand its mechanisms uh, and the things that it, uh, you know, that is predictive of. And we know that this is one of the ways by which things like traumatic experiences impact health. Okay, so with that, I'm going to actually end this module. Uh, I'd like to invite you, if you haven't uh, already uh, come on board to my Facebook page, if you're interested in the subject that we're talking about in these modules, uh, I'd encourage you to because, uh, you know, I, a lot of stuff we post every week um, that comes across my desk. Uh, and with that, actually, I'd like to also refer you to my websites. Uh, and particularly if you're interested in the, the pieces on trauma and health, I would refer you to those because uh, that's where um, I, I would uh, refer you to the Epidemic Science Chick site because that's where I actually put a lot of the sort of primary source articles. So if you're interested in reading more, I'd encourage you to go there. But you're welcome to look at any of my other sites. Uh, this is an area that's very of you know great interest to me, and so I tend to put a lot of uh, information up on my various sites. So with that, I'd like to thank you for coming, and uh, I'll see you next time.